I was thinking about ultimately, what do I really want? I'm 51 year old, male, never married, kind of a hopeless romantic who's seen Casablanca 75 times. <laughs> and so I have learned over a, a number of years through trial and error, and in, and in a recent study published by Scientific America that canvassed the globe, in the last 200 years, there has not been a single case of a male getting a first date with a female using an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> that, that, that puts me at a disadvantage, obviously. You, you like to stay with your strong suits. And so I, I was thinking about my own sad, sad story with regards to dating. And, and as I was doing it, of course, I, I was walking because I've got 6,500 some steps and here today is Mark Lefebvre, my Fitbit nemesis. We, we are part of the same group and we battle every week. And as I was thinking about my steps and Mark, I was taken back to fifth grade, first day of school. I'm hanging out with Doug Ward, Mark Laurent, and Marty Kaiser. Marty Kaiser was my first nemesis. Marty, he was good looking. That's, that's, yeah, we, that wasn't a good thing. He, he was pretty charming. He was tall. Mark Lefebvre was tall too. I mean. Well, we're standing there talking and uh, I mean, Marty wasn't a rocket scientist by any means and he had his own re reasons for disliking me because when we did math races, which was a thing in fourth grade and then later in fifth grade where you would do your times tables and they would and the teacher would give you things, and you would race to get done. Oh, I was undefeated in that. And, and M Marty was good at sports. He was not good at math, and he held that against me. So we had our own valid reasons for this, this relationship. And we're sitting there, day one, fifth grade. And at that time, the major news events were the Legos we had gotten over the summer. Obviously, that was, that was a big deal. And in walked Terry and Tracy Holtz sisters, middle class, and they were twins, which in fifth grade, I don't know why that's a lot of points, but they're a little cute as a button, and I was immediately smitten with Terry Holtz, and, and they looked alike, but Terry had a couple freckles, and I don't know why that gave her points, but the freckles, oh, they're so, so adorable. And Marty Kaiser, he liked Terry too, didn't he? Well, so it began, the fifth grade wooing, and I, I, was, I was overmatched. By second or third month, there had been a lot of skateboarding. And next to Northwood Elementary Hill was, or elementary school was Death Hill, which at the time was at about this angle. And when I went back a few years ago, it was like this. It was like one degree. But the thing that we did is we had our skateboards and we would, you would get on the skateboard and the girl, would be across from you, so the skateboard would be parallel. You put your feet up, and you would hold hands, and you would go down Death Hill, and if you were good, you could make the turn. If not, you, you, you wrecked horribly and ended up in a pile with the girl. So it, 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 I mean, it was the first win-win of my life. <laughs> and so, you know, it, 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 it was a Tracy was delightful too. I mean, they're just, just both wonderful girls, but I was so much, a love for the ages, for Terry Holtz. And back in the day, roller skating was the thing, and so that's what we did on Saturday night. We went to the roller rink, and it took all of my courage to ask her during the week, because obviously during the week there's notes, there's colored pencils, there's things back and forth, and it was a five-day process to get to the point where I asked her to go on the moonlight thing with me, more hand-holding. It came to that night, and I chickened out. I was too scared. I completely blew it. I'm 51 now. I'm still telling the story. <laughs> I haven't gotten over it. Since then, my, my, my game hasn't improved. And I was thinking about this, that this morning on the drive-in, and I was thinking about my passions, and because 
to date, the Excel thing hasn't worked. Uh, I was thinking, what if I use my power of copywriting, which I think I've gotten pretty good at, for a new nonfiction genre, which I like to call coffee flirting? <laughs> is, is that a possibility? And it certainly seems like, I mean, I think, I think we can say it's, it's, it's a better idea than using Excel spreadsheet, since the data is in on that. And so I started thinking about the importance of copywriting and how it really can change everything about your life. In yesterday's speech, I talked about uh, my friend who got a $100,000 job, photography job, mm -hmm. because of a biography, a uh, CV biography thing that I wrote for him that was so much better. I got an email from a woman last week who she is a part-time writer and lost her job and then got the first job, that, the one that she really wanted, because she used the copywriting that I had taught her. It is amazing. And I said, you folks have read my post in the 20 books to 50K. 500 to 750 likes. Some of those posts are 1,500 words, which on a Facebook post is close to a million. No, nobody will read a block of 1,500 word of text unless they're small, short, punchy, open loops, which an open loop is simply, I've got this great thing I wanna tell you, but before I do, let me tell you this other thing. And then at some point you come back to that and it keeps people sucked in and so you can use that. And we're authors, we have newsletters. So if you're not using copywriting for your description, you're probably not using it for your newsletter. J.A. Huss, she has an amazing street team of, uh, I don't know the exact number, don't quote me on it, but it's 700 to 1,000 people. She's a romance author that does very well. And she, the, the, the beta readers get her book and they read it and they love it. And th they, on day one, she doesn't ask them to buy her book, but the thing she leaves out of the copy that they got is her letter to readers, which I'm not a romance reader, but I've read her letters. They are brilliant. She, she's just naturally good at storytelling. She's funny. There's some cussing. Michael, you might enjoy those. Uh, there, there's, there's a little bit of cussing in there. And so these people who are not obligated to buy her book have already read the books, will buy it, and she launches at $4.99, and they're paying for maybe 800 words and they've already read the book. So that, that's the power of copywriting. And so I, I want you to think about that. The first thing that I would like everybody to try to do, whether you're on Facebook or you're sending an email or replying to an email, replying to a fan letter, is use proper copywriting. I want an opening hook. And it doesn't matter if you are simply you liked a guinea pig video, because I assume we all watch guinea pig videos. They're so amazingly cute. That may be another reason with my dating problems. Um, the, the, the point is, when I respond to somebody, I got a new puppy. I don't just say like and then that's a cute puppy. I start off with every 500 years or so, dot, dot, dot. Along comes a Facebook post that is filled with so much cute, dot, 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 that it changes one's life. What's your puppy's name? That gets engagement. That response prior to just, oh, what a cute puppy. When I did that, I would get a like from the person that posted the puppy picture. Now when I respond, I get 15 to 20 likes and maybe seven or eight comments and whole conversations start in other threads because I use proper copywriting and I try to finish whatever the post is with some sort of call to action which in most cases is simply a question and so when I write these posts on, on 20 books to 50k I'm doing it because I have something I feel like I want to tell you folks but also it's it's practice. I try to get one of those up every week. 
I have my own group. I practice and I do it all the time. And now I talked with a person yesterday who hated, who currently hates writing descriptions as much as I hated it 18 months ago. And now copywriting is just such a fun thing. It's amazing when you see the, the likes. And, and again, that's the whole, is it, I don't know, is it, is it dopamine hit we get when, when people like it? Is that right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not a doctor, nor do I play one on TV. Um, but, but you get that feedback. And so if you want to know if you're improving as a copywriter, just look at your Facebook posts. Or if you're, I mean, I don't know, I, I don't do much with Pinterest, but that, that's another platform where, there, where dialogue happens. Twitter would be a little harder because you're limited, but just because it's hard doesn't mean you couldn't do it. But you all have historical data on Facebook. You know how many likes you're getting with your comments. And just look at the difference today versus tomorrow when you start practicing this of what happens when you limit your paragraphs to two sentences, you put a blank space in between the paragraphs that's visually appealing. And for those that don't know, to do that on Facebook, you hold down the shift key and you hit enter twice. And that adds in a carriage return for the old folks who have used typewriters, and you get your blank space. And just try it. The next time you're, you, you have something that you want to add, or somebody's asked a question and you have an answer, don't give them a five line block of text. Take those four sentences, break them into two paragraphs, and see what happens. Michael has built the most amazing, well, Michael and all of you have built the most amazing group on Facebook. The, the quantity of people that check in every day and interact and help and answer questions is staggering. What, what's the number? Are we 30,000? What, what, what's the number? 26,000 people and the engagement is fantastic. You've got this pool of people that want help. So when you answer it, help them and help yourself by giving them a visually less scary response to look at. And you will be amazed. The person will thank you. And the eight other people will start in on that conversation. I've had responses where I have as, almost as many comments in the stream that I start just answering the question as there are all the other comments. And it's because I can get you all to read 1,500 words in a Facebook post. And so it's, it's a skill you may not have. And it is not the same as prose. Don't do this in your, uh, nobody wants to read a 50,000 word romance novel written in copywriting. That's a bad idea. That's the sort of thing that I would do to try to, to woo a woman is write a 50,000 word note in, in copywriting. But the, the, the point is it's, it's, it's very easy to start. And so ultimately of all of the areas where the copywriting is going to make you the most money, it's in your description. I, I, I help a lot of authors with their descriptions and there are varying levels of quality that they come to the table with. They will send me a Word document with their description as it is. Some of them will come to me after having had discussions about my theories on copywriting and they'll give it a first try. And first tries at everything, are, they're, they're not gonna be as good as it will be when you've written 50 descriptions. Now you're saying to yourself, I don't have 50 books. I'm not going to ever write 50 descriptions. If we start sharing our descriptions and helping each other, I've written hundreds and hundreds of descriptions. I have 12 novels. So if you get an opportunity, if somebody reaches out to you and says, hey, I'm watching this book. Can you help me with my description? You've just been given an opportunity to build your skill set. So do your best and try to write their description. And here's a secret. The descriptions you write for other people are five to 10 times easier than they are when you're doing it for your own book. Because you all have you know, carried this book through three trimesters and birthed it and it's beautiful and you wanna talk about its ears and its nose and the eyes and how cute it is and that's not good copywriting. You, 
I tell people, hint at what might be in the book. Don't info dump on them about what is in the book. I read so many descriptions where I get to the end and I'm like, oh good, I just saved four ninety nine. <laughs> that was a great book. I don't even need to buy it. And so the first thing, my theory is, initially because we have such a limited attention span, we need an opening hook that is six words or less. I would pick that and give it a choice. You would like smaller words rather than long words because when people go to your Amazon page, maybe you ran an ad and they clicked on it, you've got almost zero real estate. Now in the ad world, in, in newspapers, you always hear above the fold, that's important. Get the message above the fold. So I see people trying to pack a lot of words above the fold. I try to keep it under three short lines, no more than 18 words. I don't want there to be a lot of information above the fold. I want there to be a hook. I want them to have to click read more because the mindset is now they've got so little space. You almost always need to click read more. So people see your cover on the ad. They probably don't even read the copy. They go they're to your description and their eyes are looking for the read more button. They haven't even started to read at all. If that opening hook is short, short enough that when you're looking dead center in the hook, your peripheral vision can read the whole thing almost as if it's one word and they notice something to the effect of he knew one thing, dot, dot, dot. I, I, I misuse ellipses all the time for the grammar and editing Nazis and that's my design. He knew one thing, dot, dot, dot. Blank line, dot, dot, dot. Dames were trouble. It's short, they're both short. It's a hook. It also, who here's used the word dame in the last 50 years? <laughs> my book takes place in 1955 New York. I don't have to tell them. They've seen the cover. It's got, it's sort of art deco. They already have a lot of information. I've just used the word dame. So there's, so there's some information there. They then go to the next line, which I, I, I don't have my own description memorized, but I go through and, and at no point in my description do I talk about what's in the book. She walked in, she sat down, she crossed her legs. Boy, could she cross a leg. Before she even started to tell him what she needed, Henry wondered if he was being played. She knew how to get her away. The red dress, or she knew how to get her away. The dress, or the lips, the dress. The dress was a sort, it was a, ah, I'm messing it up. The, the, the Dior dress was the type that would make an hourglass self-conscious. <laughs> uh, 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 I, I should just read it to you, I, I, but the point is, I don't talk about my book. I just paint this little scene, and having worked on trying to get this description better, when I had the old, like, two giant blocks of text, one in 30, I had to pay for 30 clicks to get a conversion. When I started learning copywriting, and I wrote, told about what was going on in the book, but I had a little bit of hook in there, got down to maybe one in 15, then I started doing more hooks and thinking about how my limited attention span got down to one in 10, and the last one where I don't talk about what's in the book converts it one in eight, and that's a lot of money. I've had over 600,000 clicks that I paid for, and a lot of them were before I'd done that. So if you think about your hook, you can, you can improve your bottom line. And hooks are not a list of facts. He was a special agent. She was good looking. That short, it, it, it looks like what I do, but if you're a romance writer, and, and there's a lot, I, I, I know romance is a huge job. How many of you are romance writers? Very good. One of the things that I try to do when I'm helping somebody with a description 
is I try to eliminate words that aren't necessary because I'm going for short, I'm going for concise. Do you need a last name for your character? You don't need a last name. You know what? They'll learn Mark's last name when they bought your book. Do you need to know, you know, former secretary of state? There's very little you need in your description that they can't learn when they get the book. And there's some other things that I, I'm not a romance reader or writer, but I get the sense that there may be a trend within your genre of having attractive characters. <laughs> I, I feel like that's the case. So some of the time, maybe most of the time, the guys are gorgeous. The women are good looking. And I see descriptions where they say that, and as and I, I'm guessing a lot, if not all of, well, probably all of you romance writers are romance readers. And so if you've written a romance and your character has a dad bod, maybe you mentioned that. That's something a little different. But his ripped abs, we're like, of course he has ripped abs. I've read 182 romance novels this year, and they all have ripped abs. It's a given. You're not, you're, you're not adding to the scenario. Again, the point, I mean, I was sort of joking about the dad bod, but if you ever write one with a dad bod, that, that would be a hook, because that, that would be interesting. It would be different. Saying they're sexy is not a hook, so, so, don't, so don't put that in there. Try to figure out what is the hook, and, and don't just say that she had a new, uh, she, she was out of a bad relationship, she needed to make a change, she found John and it was the answer. Her relationship destroyed her life. She couldn't go on like this. Would she survive? Mark walked in and she barely even noticed him. Something to that effect. Were, were, you, were you just hinting that, and, and again, as readers, you all know that those are the people that are, are gonna fall in love, but you don't need to say it. And you don't need to say they did A, B, and C. Just hint at it and you will get more conversions because people will stay and read to the end of your 300 words and that's the point. And so if you can work on that, work on practicing your uh, copywriting all the time, it will improve your conversion rate, and you'll find you don't hate writing those emails. I'm just curious, of the authors here, how many people cringe when it is time to do the description? Is that, like, and I quote, it's the worst part of writing the book. <laughs> And it is, and it is, it is vastly harder. I, I said this earlier, it is vastly harder to do it for your own book than somebody else's. And again, not to just talk about the, the Roman community, but I know in the community, there's a lot of, um, you, you're great like teammates. You, you help each other out. So if you and one of your fellow writers are, have a release coming up next month, get on Facebook, put the descriptions that you've written that you know aren't that good, and swap, and then rewrite each other's descriptions. Because I don't need to know anything about what's in the book to write good copy. Now, to write great copy, sometimes you do, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. Yes? There you go. She used to hate writing descriptions. She took my course, and we worked on descriptions together over Skype, and now she likes copywriting. So it can be done. The point is, you all, we all have connections right here in this room where you can swap out descriptions and you'll find how easy it is to write for someone else. But it's a mindset thing. I mean, it's oh, yeah. It, uh, can we get rid of my call? There, there we go. Part of it's a real mindset thing. I mean, when you start to write books, you're told that, that writing descriptions is is terrible and awful and scary. Well, yes. and, and you get that, but but taking your course showed me a whole different way of writing them, a whole different purpose behind what I'm trying to do, and it made it so much easier. So, uh, so if you 
look at the purpose of why you write your blurbs and, and what you do with your blurbs and your descriptions, it, it totally changes why it's so hard or so easy to do. And, um, and, and I, I don't even need to help her with her descriptions now. I mean, we, we went through two or three, and that's the amazing thing, is that you know, the process is, is simple. I, I like to get on Skype and, and say, okay, this is it, and then analyze why that line didn't work or why those extra adjectives weren't necessary. I've seen so many paragraphs, three, four lines, where it is really good prose. And I tell them, this is so good. I love that writing. It's crap. <laughs> and he's not kidding. He will tell you if it's crap. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't pull my punches. And so the, the, the point is, if you do what I asked and start using shift and enter, enter to add spaces on a regular basis, that will become easier. You'll see the results in that you'll get more likes. You'll believe me. And you'll start to do more of it. The next thing that you need to know is that for me, when I first started doing the descriptions and saw immediate, one in 30 down to one in 10, one in 12, the immediate improvement because of hubris, I, I just assumed I was great, you will get better at it. You know, when you've done 10 of them, you'll be better than the first one. And so if you have a number of books and you rewrite all of your descriptions, those, say you have 10 books, by the time you get through the 10th one, it is worthwhile going back because you can probably improve the first one by 10 or 20%. You'll get ideas because your mind will start thinking that way in terms of hooks. And they're everywhere. They're, they're absolutely everywhere. We watch TV, magazines, at the bottom of CNN, the, it, clickbait, clickbait. I look at clickbait because you won't believe what Ali Sheely looks like today. Okay, I, I, don't, I never really liked her in cheer, or Ali, no, uh, who's the Cheers woman? Uh, Christy Alley. I didn't really like her in Christy Alley. Or I didn't like Christy Alley in Cheers. I'm not a fan of her, but I am curious. <laughs> and I know that Christy Alley's picture is probably not even in the article, or if it is, it's um, after 30 pages. I, and damn it, I still click on it. And then I give up before I ever see how she looks today. That's a great example of copywriting. If you subscribe to newsletters, start to read them through the eyes of a copywriter and see which ones you, you are hooked on, and that will make you better. The point is, as you're doing this, if six months, by the time we get here next year, you should have done all of your descriptions twice. Because no matter how good you get it the first time, you'll be better in six months and you'll want to do it again because it, 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 it's 20 minutes, 30 minutes of your time to improve your revenue stream for the next 20, 30, 200 years. However, I plan on living to 350. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a very little time commitment to, to really change your business. The, the next thing I want to think, I want you to look at is obviously not everybody's a data person. Uh, oh, uh, you can ask a question in just a moment. I want to finish this up. Not everybody's a data person. I want you all to be data people. But for those who are, and if you look at your conversion rate, that's a good thing to do to know if your description got better. And if you're one of those people and you try your description and say you're at 1 in 30 and it goes to 1 in 27, well, that's an improvement. But you can get to 1 in 10 or 1 in 8. So I had a recent experience to in fact, where the, the, the one person was, he had this, the genre was sort of horror, sort of thriller. I don't, I don't really read horror, I, I, I frighten easily, and much like a guinea pig. And so we were doing this description and I helped him with it and the, first, the original one was pretty bad and then we, we put some hooks in there based on what he was telling me. It, the story has a lot to do with the harvesting of organs. And that made me cringe a little bit, but it's not my genre, okay? So he did it, and it, it went from one in 30 to one in 27. And I was like, oh, those are good hooks, but it may just be that it's gross. <laughs> How big a deal is the harvesting of organs 
to the overall theme of the book. Well, it, it's a small detail. Why are we focusing on the small, gory detail that makes me want to not even think about your book, let alone purchase it? They said, well, that's an excellent point. We could talk about this, and I don't remember what the this was, but I, oh my God, that's, that's, that's frightening. Let's do that. One in 10, I mean, immediately. The next woman I helped, we, we redid her, her opening hooks, and she reached out to me last week. Now, I don't, I don't know the results because I haven't talked to her since then, but again, not much change. It was, it was a little improvement because it, it was you know, three giant blocks of text, and so at least the formatting was good. The two opening hooks, the, the genre was young adult angst or something. I, I, I don't know. But the, the opening two hooks, I really liked. And so because I, I, I help so many authors throughout the day, when somebody hits me up on Facebook, even if I work with them a week before, I don't remember the name of their book. I, so, so she said, I, I need some help. Great, let's go on Skype. So we got on Skype, and I said, I don't remember the book, give me the link. So we did, looked at it, and I read the two of the first three lines. I really, really liked them. The third line ended in something about, uh, will they fall in love? Which, that, that's a good question. And I'm always make the wrong assumption that in every genre, the majority of readers are women because women just read more. But that's not always the case. And in her specific genre, she knew historically she had more boy readers than girl readers. This is another thing that I want you to do. You may have a sense for your readership. You may be assuming what your readership is, but you know what? If you've got 100 reviews and you go through, maybe 70% of them, you can tell the gender of the reviewer. So just go through and look and just scroll through and, and do tallies and figure out what percentage of my readership is which gender because we did that for her and, and she thought it was mostly boys. It was more boys, we think, than she had thought. And how many 13-year-old boys are hooked by will fall in love? Zero of them. That, that, that's the correct answer. I don't know who said it. I heard it from this. This area had the correct answer. It is zero. So you don't want your hook to be zero. You want, and so we changed it to, I, I don't know, playing with frogs or something. It, 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 it was a 13-year-old boy thing. Uh, the point is we came up with a different hook. And the rest, I mean, it was, it was all good. It was just that one thing that I imagined, because that was above the fold. And so their glance was, you know. And, 13-year-old boys do like girls, but they're not going to admit it by buying a book. And so that's important. You may change your description. You may reach out to me and say, Brian, it didn't work. It may be as simple as one word or one phrase. And so you, sir, now may ask a question. <laughs> is there any point to do... Close the mic, please. Oh. Is there any point to... Uh, Okay. Put, put the okay. mic in, yes. in your mouth. <laughs> is, is there any point to doing uh, this sort of co uh, close copy ed or copywriting on the later books in the series? Oh, oh, oh that's a good question. Oh, take, take two points out of petty cash. Well played, sir. Yes, there is, but it is less important. Where it becomes important, a question was asked yesterday, perhaps my favorite question, does it make sense to advertise Amazon ads for later books in the series? My answer was, if you're new to AMS, don't. Focus on the book ones, the first box set, because you have a lot to learn. Once you kind of know what you're doing, you can absolutely advertise the later books in the series. So to answer, his question, he's gone, I don't know where he went. Oh, he's, uh, anyway, to answer this gentleman's question, yes, it does matter when you get to that point. So right now, if most of the readers that are buying book two through four are doing so because they just finished book one, it is less important than it is once you start trying to drive traffic to those books. But just like Craig's point about 
you know, the thing that sells the next book is, well, if you do good launches and you're gonna drive and you're gonna get a good ranking and people that have not seen book one are seeing book two or book three or whatever, then again, it matters just as much as book one. It depends on the scenario and where you're at in the process. I think for most of you that are maybe four or five, six books into this business, it probably does matter, but you want to get the book, the first one done. The, the other point, like I said earlier, you might as well do them all because that's the practice that you need. That's why I always tell people on AMS ads, don't use the copy button until you're making $10,000 a month from AMS ads because you're not good enough at writing the ad copy. So write new ones. Yes, ma'am. A uh, quick question on uh, famous names. Could you use famous names in ad copy? I, I don't know all the le legalities. You can use Brian Meeks. <laughs> um, but if you've uh, been yeah, but, but if you were, like, with them in a magazine. Yeah, like yeah, I mean, it, that's the sort of, I mean, if, if you're saying, you don't want to say J.K. Rowling says, you don't want to attribute a quote to the, I, I, you know what, I'm just not even going to answer that. Where is Joe? Joe might know, he knows more legal stuff than I do, but I think that's a question for a lawyer because copyright law is incredibly interesting and complex. Are you aware that if you have a photo of the Eiffel Tower, La Tour Eiffel, at night, technically you can't post it on Facebook. You're violating their copyright because the Eiffel Tower is not copywritten. The light show is. You can't show the Opera House in Sydney. You can't show any of Gary's architectural, Gary, the architect who has done the, the museums, like in LA or whatever. That's all copywritten. And the thing that people don't understand about copyright, and I am not a copyright attorney, I just am fascinated by it, is that if you do not protect your copyright, you lose it. So when the Eiffel Tower sues you because you used a picture of it at night, on your blog, it's not because they're trying to kick the little guy, it's because if a future defendant can prove they knew you used it, they no longer have the copyright. So it's, it, it, it's a great question I don't know the answer to. I would, before you start throwing out you know, the George R. Martins of the world into your description, I, I would find out from somebody that really knows the answer. So Thank I'm sorry. You. So I, I, I get, get no points on that question. Next. Uh, can you give us some suggestions? If you want to get our toes wet in trying to learn more about copywriting, can you give us some suggestions for books or things we can look Yes, at? I can. The book that started it all for me, I reached out to Sean Platt of Self Publishing Podcast. He's a former copywriter. And I said, I want a book. And he suggested Ad Week by Joseph Sugarman. And then, as I said yesterday, the worst copywriting in a subtitle on all of Amazon. It is, it's like 400,000 words in the subtitle. It's so horrible. But the book, which is examples from, is absolutely great. By the time you're page 150, you'll be excited about copywriting. 26 seconds, and I, I'm good. That, that, that's it, I, I have nothing else. Uh, I don't know if copy flirting will work, but I'll keep you posted.